Yeah, uh, this is a tutorial session, and we have two speakers, uh, Dr. Eric and Dr. Simon, to uh, start the session with his remarks on Boreal Summer International Oscillation. OK. All right, thank you, Kieran. So this is the first of our uh, two tutorial talks. Um, so I'm going to give one on the BSISO. So a little bit worried about this because our, our whole uh, uh, meeting here has been sort of a BSISO tutorial. Um, so um, that worries me a little bit. And uh, um, secondly, there's probably many people in this room who, who could give me a tutorial on the BSISO. So um, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm, th I'm going to throw in a few other things as well um, that um, are a little bit more provocative in addition to the tutorial on recent research that um, I'll leave you with. So it'll be more than a little bit more than just a tutorial um, talk here. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, so first of all, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to uh, my research group and some of the other things that we're doing in my research group. Um, the core of this is going to be this BSISO tutorial that um, I'm going to do. And then lastly, I'll show a few more recent research results of mine on the BSISO, particularly related to climate change and also wind-induced flux variability, you know, things I didn't talk about yesterday. Um, so first I'll talk about my research group. Um, I gave this talk in like three minutes at, at CSU to our new graduate students. Might, might take a little bit more time here. Um, so just to tell you where I'm from, there we go. So um, my department here is at uh, Colorado State University, um, right in the center of the US, middle of a dusty, con large dusty continent. Um, very dry, very arid, although we have large uh, mountain ranges uh, around us that uh, you know, get up to 4,500 meters uh, with beautiful wildflowers and uh, things like that. This is our department um, right up here um, on a hill, right on the west side of our town, right up against the Rocky Mountains. Um, generally, um, what I work on is tropical meteorology. Um, I study climate dynamics, um, generally. I do um, work on air-sea interaction. Um, the tools that I use are models, satellite observations, reanalysis, um, and Increasingly, I'm getting involved in field programs like Piston that I talked about um, yesterday. Um, I've been at CSU um, since 2008, and before that, I was at Oregon State as a faculty member, and I um, met Emily there, and um, um, I knew Simon before that, but Simon was, you know, um, you know, soon followed me at Oregon State. Um, so most of my time, um, you could find me sitting in front of a computer screen like that at my desk, but um, you know, every so often I do get out into the field. Um, all the seagoing oceanographers probably um, you know think nothing of this picture, but you know, I was, got very excited for my first shipborne experience and uh, trying. What's this suit called? It's, uh, okay, yeah. So trying that on was sort of a highlight of my summer. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, there was more than yeah. There was more than that. <laughs> um, so just a little brief overview of my, my group um, before the BSISO tutorial. Um, one of my students, Justin Whitaker, is studying easterly waves. Um, you know, we're studying easterly waves in the Western Pacific, but we're also studying them near the coast of South America and Central America. So this is you know, snapshots of easterly waves moving um, east westward with time. And um, the reason I wanted to talk about this is that we're going to have a field program in this region in 2019, um, August and September, called OTREK, where we're going to have an aircraft flying over you know, both the East Pacific and Caribbean in the region of the Costa Rica Dome, so looking at uh, the formation of convective disturbances and also um, how they interact with the ocean. Um, I'm out of time. OK, Mike Natoli. Um, is a graduate student of mine who was actually on the Thompson during Piston. So this is a picture of Mike sucking on helium or something like that. Um, and uh, he's studying the diurnal cycle of convection um, near the Philippines. And so this plot here, I wish it showed up a little bit better, is actually the modulation of the diurnal cycle by the BSISO. So these are eight phases of the BSISO. Um, longitude is here, time, 0 to 24 hours is here, 
And one interesting thing that we're seeing um, with our observations is that there's actually an increase in offshore propagation of diurnal convective disturbances in advance of sort of the big blob of ISO convection that goes over you. So this is um, a possible way that land interactions might actually help the BSISO go northward. Um, yeah, that's Seymour precipitation. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then, you know, this is the terrain. So the terrain is basically right here. So that's the coast of the Philippines. Um, completely unrelated. Well, this is not completely unrelated to what we're doing here. But uh, I have a student, Kai Chi, uh, who is um, from Taiwan, who's co-advised with Elizabeth Barnes. And we're studying tropical, extratropical interactions with the MJO. I want to talk more about that. but. I was struck by this picture of Kai Chi. It looks exactly like my, my lobster suit picture that I showed you earlier. It's, it's, but he's on a snowboard in the Colorado mountains. <clears throat> um, and then Emily Riley Della Ripa is a research scientist of mine who has been doing modeling in the piston domain. And so we're looking at the diurnal cycle in the Philippines and the effect of topography. So we, for example, have doubled the topography of the Philippines in this run, uh, flattened topography in another run, and looked at the, both the strength and the timing of the diurnal cycle. And so with topography, you get a stronger diurnal cycle, diurnal cycle with um, stronger onset. Um, and there's also very interesting behavior, whether you run this model in active or suppressed BSISO phases as well. So. Um, we just submitted a paper on this. Um, another member of my group is Bohar Singh. Um, Bohar got his degree at George Mason and has been working with me for about a year. And I'll talk about Bohar's work later, but we've actually been using satellite wind speed products to understand it, the um, effect of wind-induced fluxes on northward propagation of the BSISO. So this will be something I talk about later um, in the, so I won't talk about these panels here now. And then uh, Hien is a postdoc of mine, and um, she is actually studying how the uh, climate change um, in, um, in a particular climate model and suite of climate models, CMIP 5 climate models, um, affects the strength of the MJO. And this is something I'll get to later in the talk as well. There's very interesting things that happen to the MJO in future climate, such as precipitation variance going up and wind variability going down that also have implications for future climate of the BSISO. So this will be something I talk about um, at the end of the, end of the talk. And then I also have a postdoc, um, Jin, who is studying 10 to 20 day variability in boreal um, summer in the Northwest Pacific. So this actually follows nicely from some of the discussion um, that, that we had yesterday. And so Jin just joined me um, a few weeks ago, actually. OK, so that's just an introduction to my group. Um, the core of this, as I mentioned, is going to be a tutorial on the BSISO. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about here um, are some basic characteristics. And so we already saw some of these basic characteristics yesterday, but I'm going to expand on this a little bit, particularly to look at global impacts of the BSISO. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, related to that about the motivation for studying this phenomenon. Obviously, um, there's a lot of motivation locally here, but there's also motivation remotely, um, even in the Atlantic and East Pacific. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the propagation dynamics. I talked about some of that yesterday. I'm not going to talk about horizontal advection and SST um, convergence as much today because I already covered that. But one thing that I'm going to talk about is the importance of synoptic scale disturbances and how that might feed back onto the propagation of the BSISO. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, efforts at real time monitoring. So. Um, Particularly, I'm going to talk about um, an index by um, Juni Lee et al. in 2013, how we use this index to define the BSISO and how we use this index to, de to uh, define it and, and um, diagnose it in real time. Um, so that's something that I'll also cover. Then after this, I'll talk about the climate change and wind-induced flux as well. <clears throat> 
Okay, so um, I didn't show this particular plot yesterday, but I'll you know, I show the BSISO version of this, which I'll also show again. Um, but this is a um, composite evolution of this phenomenon that we call the Madden-Julian oscillation. And so what this is, is a composite light cycle that was derived by Adrian Matthews at the University of East Anglia. And he used an index called um, the real-time MJO index, which was derived by Wheeler and Hendon in 2004. Um, it's an EOF-based index that um, I, I won't define specifically here, but I'll talk about EOFs and how they define a boreal summer version of this phenomenon later on. Um, so this whole movie here takes you know 48 days to, to go through. And what you see here is MGO convection starting here in the Indian Ocean, um, moving off to the east with time. It does funny things in the maritime continent, but then reemerges over uh, the Western Pacific Ocean. And in wintertime, it sort of dies here just to the east of the dateline. Um, here's that movie again. Um, interestingly, over the maritime continent, um, you often see over land, so if you look right here, land, pre land precipitation tends to start first before the large oceanic um, envelope comes over you. So that has actually sparked a lot of interest in the impact of land and intraseasonal oscillations in this region. And there was a paper by Peatman that argued that land sort of acts as a vanguard of precipitation to sort of draw the MJO east over the maritime continent. That's a little bit controver more controversial today, but it's actually one of the motivations for Piston as well to study um, land interactions like this um, that, that we see in the, in the boreal winter version of the MJO as well. Um, all right, so this is you know, MJO precipitation. There's also large-scale circulations associated with the MJO. I won't get into those because that's not really a focus um, of this talk. The focus of this talk is this plot that I presented yesterday. So similar evolution to the previous MJO plot, but now you see boreal summer ISO, BSISO, or monsoon interseasonal oscillation, if you want to call it that. Um, so it starts here again in the Indian Ocean, you know, like the MJO, but unlike the MJO, um, it you know, both propagates eastward, so you can see reach the Western Pacific, um, but maybe more prominent in this particular plot is the northward propagation that you see into um, both the Indian subcontinent and also into the Western Pacific. And another interesting aspect of that is that the um, Convection tends to be aligned in a southeast northwest uh, oriented rain band um, that many models have a hard time actually capturing. Um, so the, the structure of this is um, very, very interesting. Um, so this is a local image. I'll, I'll show you some of the remote effects as well of, of this later on, especially over here in the Atlantic and East Pacific, um, which are very, very interesting as well. Yeah. How exactly Yes. Yeah, so this is a Sperber and Anomaly paper, and I think they use some sort of an EOF analysis. I can't remember the exact details, but they um, you know generated a covariance matrix on um, I think it was OLR data, so they input an outgoing long wave radiation time series. Um, that was filtered to 20 to 100 days or something like that and made a covariance out of it and they found the leading eigenvectors of the covariance matrix and basically those are the spatial structures that explain the most amount of variance in um, large-scale precipitation. And so typically in analysis like this you come up with two leading eigenvectors that are in quadrature that basically explain a propagating signal. Right, so, if you were just at to say, oh, okay, well, how much, how much rainfall was playing? You know, if you wanted to know what the rainfall was over the day, then, well, that's better. You know, relative to the synopsis. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll show that. Um, I don't want to show the last slide of my talk, but. but <laughs> yeah, sorry, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let, let me, answer, let me answer the, that question for you. Um, whoa. Yikes. <laughs> um, there's one figure here um, that I wanted to show you related to that. Um, this is an analysis by Kamarkar et al. 2015 showing the amount of Indian precipitation variance on different time scales. And so um, recently, um, it's maybe like 20% of the variance. 
on those time scales. Um, and it's actually consistent with the amount of variance explained by the first two EOFs um, as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So certainly um, it explains less variance than the northern hemisphere um, um, winter version of this phenomenon, the MJO. So you know, the MJO, if you look at the variance explained by it, it's higher than, than here. There's just a lot going on in summertime <laughs> in addition to this. Yeah, yeah. No, interrupt at any time. Yeah. In this analysis, I think it was, um, but there's a, I'm going to show a Lee et al. paper later where um, they don't do any filtering and they just do the EOF analysis with the raw anomalies and their second set of modes is 10 to 20 days or higher time scales. It comes out of that. But this one I think was filtered first. Yeah. All right, so one thing I didn't show yesterday, and I don't know how well this shows up. Oh. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, eastward propagating band also, once it goes to the east, uh, sorry, uh, the westward propagating band, this oh, red goes towards here, it, which is the, I think the 10 to 20 day mode. This one right here? Used, yes. Yeah. So is it really filtered or not? I think that this is filtered. I, I might be wrong, but I'll check. Because this is, I think, the 10 to 20 day mode that. The figure says top 20 to 100 days is the top Does it? Oh, right here. So top, so it's filtered to 20 to 100 days first. So it could be, yeah, so there could be some of that 10 to 20 day move leading into this, I guess. It doesn't look like that because the phase relation with the Bay of Bengal is wrong. It's not the 10 to 20. Both of them have the same time scale. So by the time this goes there, that one is going. So both should be of same time period, not uh, different time scales. This is a single phenomena making the full circle. So the time it takes for it to go from here to there is same as for that one to complete the cycle. So the cycle time should be same for both. Same. This is not the 10 to 20. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, basically the same. Th uh, Actually, this is a different compositing analysis. So this is a compositing analysis based on Lee et al.'s method I'll talk about later. But um, this is basically eight panels that broadly resemble that previous um, animation that I showed, just broken out into still form. And blue on here is enhanced convection. So again, that moves northward. You get this um, northwest, southeast tilted rain band here. Um, and the other thing that's shown on here are 850 millibar winds, and these are really, really hard to see, but, you know, in association with enhanced convection here, you get generally cyclonic flow with easterly wind anomalies to the north and westerly wind anomalies near and to the south of this convective blob. And this is consistent with that signal I showed yesterday where the easterly winds north of here were advecting moisture across a mean moisture gradient and moistening to the north of this convective blob. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than, you know, sort of the off equatorial gill model, but if you use a shallow water model and specify a heat source off the equator, you, you will get a circulation that looks broadly like this, although, um, there are differences. There are there's a means different uh, mean state wind than the Gill model, which assumes a resting state that changes the nature of the flow and stuff like that. But you might be able to arrive at the first order um, sense of you know enhanced convection with cyclonic low level flow from a very simple model like like Gill to, to explain these wind anomalies. And then you know as this band moves northward, these wind anomalies tend to move northward with it. Um, 
then you know, see, you see similar phase relationships here in the Western Pacific. And I'm sorry, this is so muddy and you can't really see those vectors on top of the blue, but it's also cyclonic associated with enhanced convection there. So um, obviously there are very strong projections of the BSISO precipitation anomaly onto active and break periods of the monsoon, which has been studied a lot. Um, you know, previously, and this is one example of a composite analysis where there's been um, a compositing done for break um, periods of the monsoon here and active periods of the monsoon here. And you can see that um, break periods, it's kind of hard to see here, but India is, is, is over here. Um, uh, Active break periods are associated sort of with this tilted band of suppressed convection, which extends from the um, Indian Ocean into the Western Pacific. And, and likewise, the active monsoon period is associated with a very similar um, tilted rain band. And so the MJ, or the BSISO actually projects um, very strongly onto um, you know, this state that is composite and based on active and break periods. Um, so it's one of the, one of the things that, um, you know, People in this room could tell me tell more about um, obviously um, is, is responsible for break periods in the monsoon. <laughs> okay, so um, before we look at broader aspects, I just wanted to show this again. Um, I wish this projector were a little bit brighter. Um, uh, this this again shows the composite evolution of the BSISO in OLR anomalies. So this is like half of a cycle of BSISO. So all in our, all OLR anomalies are in blue that are negative, and then uh, sea surface temperature anomalies are in red. So there's a signal, like um, I talked about yesterday, associated with warm SSTs to the north of convection, and then um, colder SSTs following to the south. Um, so we talked about this a lot, and you know, the impact that this might have on um, you know, moving the MJO um, northward. Thank you. But the other interesting thing I wanted to show you is that um, SST and convection anomalies are not only isolated to the Eastern Hemisphere, there's also a very strong um, signal associated with BSISO here over the uh, um, you know, Western part of North America. So this is one particular phase here where you have enhanced convection over the Indian Ocean and generally suppressed convection here over the Western Pacific. At this time, there is actually a very, very strong intraseasonal uh, anomaly that you see here off the coast of the Americas. There's um, colder sea surface temperatures here. Um, I don't have the scale, but these are on the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees Celsius negative anomalies. And it's superimposed on this. Um, I don't think you could see it very well. There's actually a um, um, negative OLR anomaly sitting here associated with a very strong convective anomaly right off the coast of the Americas. So one thing that you know, people don't often appreciate is that you know, once the BSISO reaches the Western Pacific, it teleconnects very strongly through the equatorial waveguide with the Western Hemisphere. And it produces very strong impacts over here on tropical cyclones, hurricanes, um, um, and other types of weather. And I'll talk about um, a few of those things later on, but this is a really interesting signal that um, we're hoping to explore this coming summer in 2019. So sort of the um, America's version of the BSISO, I guess um, you, you would call it, yeah. So the propagation um, mechanism for how this teleconnects is a Kelvin wave that goes right, you know, atmospheric Kelvin wave that is you know, trapped in the waveguide. And it initiates um, convection over in this region once it reaches the coast of the Americas. So um, one reason that the Atlantic doesn't feel as strongly is that um, the Andes block part of the propagation of that atmospheric signal. So that's you know, one reason there's not as strong of an effect here. But the second um, reason is that the sea surface temperatures aren't quite as warm they're not warm there as well. The sea surface temperatures in this region are as warm as they are in, in the you know, Indo-Pacific warm pool during, during summertime. But here, they're, you know, the Gulf of Mexico is warm, but, but this part of the Atlantic's more marginal. Yeah. 
Um, this bottom panel here is the A50 millibar zonal wind anomalies. And you know, when there are easterly anomalies here, you tend to see very, very strong westerly anomalies here right off the coast of the America. So um, very interesting dipole pattern in um, um, yeah, the wind anomalies and also interesting precipitation variations. Um, I should note that this was actually um, some work of the Clive RMGO working group and uh, um, this is based on Matt Wheeler and Harry Hendon's index, how this was derived. Well, it's more like we know what the MJO is today. Um, we could you know, statistically determine um, how tropical cyclone activity two or three weeks from now, not individual storms, but you know, numbers of events, um, you know, it, it relates to the MGO index at you know, day zero. And we could develop a st statistical model of that. Um, it, you know, that's one way that people are using this information. You know, for example, a climate prediction center in the United States um, looks at this index and, um, you know, I guess, I guess I shouldn't say qualitatively, but, but you know, um, you know, uses you know, information about the modulation of TCs by the MJO to come up with um, a forecaster's assessment of, of, of what TC activity might be in the East Pacific and Gulf of Mexico three weeks from now. Yeah, although the ECMWF model, you know, you could probably push it out. If you use a dynamical model, the like ECMWF model, you could probably push it out farther four or five weeks and say something about the organization of the tropics of that time scale. Uh, excuse me. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that seem to suggest that this uh, BSISO is kind of feeding or making situation conducive for the El Nino uh, or like in terms of cause and effect? Can we think like this is the cause for the El Nino in some sense? Yeah, I mean, people have looked at that. Um, you know, probably more the. Um, I think I think they interact with each other, and so you know the MJO or BSISO, you know, provides wind stress on the equator that can send oceanic Kelvin waves eastward, and at the beginning of the MJO, uh, of the Avenso events, the MJO starts to move, migrate eastward as well in terms of its center of activity. So I, I think there's a mutual interaction that like Fei Fei Jin has looked at where, you know, the MJO can, you know, uh, through downwell and Kelvin waves can support ENSO. And then once, you know, SST anomalies with ENSO develop, you can modulate the MJO and move it eastward as well. Um, that then produces more wind stress anomalies, you know, closer to the specific and so on. So I think it's a two-way interaction, but yeah. Okay, so as far as impacts, um, we saw this plot uh, a few times uh, during this uh, meeting. So this is uh, Dr. Goswami's um, 2008 analysis, and I think you know, there's a 2003 analysis that showed a similar plot to this indicating that um, there are variations in monsoon depressions for, during active and break periods of the BSISO. So that's something that we've talked about. Um, another thing that the BSISO does is it modulates African rainfall. Um, there's actually an interesting uh, question about how it modulates African rainfall. The BSISO you know, obviously exists here. It's centered in the Indian Ocean and it could send atmospheric Rossby waves to the west that can modulate the BSISO. But as I mentioned before, the BSISO can also send atmospheric Kelvin waves eastward that impinge upon this region um, from the west and potentially modulate West African convection, especially upper levels. The lower, lower levels are blocked, but at upper levels that signal can reach um, West Africa. So it's an interesting debate as to what direction the BSISO influence on Africa actually is. Um, this is something I'll talk about. Um, these are tropical depression type disturbances in the Western Pacific. Um, these kind of look like 10 to 20 day disturbances, but this is a three to nine day time scale. And this is the Western Pacific version of what we would call easterly waves in, in the Atlantic and um, uh, Eastern Pacific. So these are like 2,000 kilometer wavelength. Um, they propagate off towards the northwest here um, at you know, 10 meters per second or so. 
Um, these are major means by which tropical cyclones form in the Northwest uh, Pacific Basin. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of reasons for studying these things. Um, this is the first EOF of 850 millibar vorticity. This is, this is what this particular plot is. And so these are vorticity anomalies alternating between positive and negative. Um, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later because we think that these disturbances could be an important modulator of the BSISO, in particular, their ability to mix dry air from higher latitudes into the tropics that can suppress convection um, after you know, the BSISO is active and these disturbances become active. It, it could form the seeds of their own demise. Um, so I'll talk about this a little bit. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about is this remote impact in the Atlantic. These are um, Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea tropical cyclones as a function of phase of the BSISO. And so when westerly winds from the BSISO reach, uh, at low levels reach the Americas, there's about a fourfold increase in hurricane activity versus easterly phases of the BSISO in this region. And Hurricane Katrina, for example, happened during one of these westerly phases. And so um, on this basis, as I mentioned before, people, including us in our group, have developed uh, statistical forecast models to try to forecast um, hurricane activity based on um, information about what is the VSISO or MJO doing today. Okay. Any questions about that? These, these are storms in the Gulf during June through, um, June through October. And blue lines on here are um, tropical storms, and there's red lines that you can't see are, that are hurricanes. <laughs> um, can, can, can barely see the red lines on here, but there are you know those hurricanes on there as well. So there's about a fourfold increase in both tropical storms and hurricanes during um, this particular phase. Is that, what's the mechanism? Well, there's um, there's a few different um, hypotheses. Um, so this is a um, analysis by Susanna Camargo, Adam Sobel, Carrie Emanuel, and some others showing the potential for tropical cyclone genesis by phase of the MJO. And this particular index includes various large scale variables like vertical wind shear, um, humidity, um, low levels, uh, uh, you know, rotation, low level of vorticity. Um, I think that's it, there might be one more. And the important um, factors for modulating tropical cyclogenesis tend to vary region by region. But one thing that this study showed is that as favorable conditions for the BSISO reach the Atlantic, um, you know, Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, like here, that um, increases in um, tropospheric humidity are one important factor. Um, in, in that particular region for, for generating more intense cyclones. So basically, you start off entrainment drying, um, you know, in, in convecting uh, systems if you have a moisture atmosphere. Um, the other thing that I showed with Dennis Hartman in the Eastern Pacific is vertical wind shear is important. So if you have a lot of vertical wind shear, then that um, tends to make it um, very unlikely for uh, tropical cyclone formation and tends to weaken existing uh, tropical systems um, through a few different mechanisms. And you know the, the BSISO um, wind anomalies are associated with different sign wind anomalies at upper and lower, lower levels. And so as those come into a region, depending on how those upper and lower level um, wind anomalies add to the background flow, they vary shear. So, so that's another important reason in, in this particular area. Uh, so I think you need two heat sources symmetric about equator to get such a solution, which is Kelvin wave and the uh, Rossby wave. Uh, so what in practice, like practically, what are you attributing those two heat sources to be? So in the north, I think that heat source might be the Himalayan range and all of that, or uh, the Tibetan plateau, but in the south, what would that heat source be? Uh, um, so well, so, I mean, that's an interesting... Are you identifying it's the It's an interesting question because that relates to sort of what sets the zonal scale of the MJO. 
Um, and, and I see, you know, the ability to support positive and negative heat sources as being sort of a scale selection argument um, for the MJO. Um, for example, if you think about it, you know, east-west. Um, and, you know, there's a big debate about, uh, there's actually a big debate about that. Um, so I don't think I have, I can say anything conclusive, but it actually has to do with, um, you know, the strength of radiative feedbacks and um, how radiative feedbacks depend upon the scale of the disturbance um, in the context of destabilizing the MJO and things like that. So I think it's a, it gets onto the scale selection mechanism. So I, I don't, don't have a great answer to that, but. <laughs> okay, so um, how much time have I been going so far? I only have, I only have eight minutes left. Okay. <laughs> I told Simon I would give him more time and finish early. <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about northward propagation dynamics. Um, I, I mentioned the importance of horizontal advection that our study and other studies have found for moving the BSISO northward. Um, one thing that I didn't mention yesterday that I said I would talk about is the effect of eddies on um, horizontal advection. So, so by eddies here, I'm referring to easterly waves, so synoptic systems on three to 10 day time scales, sort of that wave train pattern that I showed you before. Um, these are two different phases of the BSISO in the Western Pacific. Um, this is a suppressed phase, and these are total winds where you tend to have easterly flow across this entire region. Um, this is the enhanced phase where you have this extension of monsoon flow from the Indian Ocean into the Western Pacific. So we call this the westerly phase, we call this the easterly phase for convenience. This period here is associated with very strong um, cyclonic shear of the zonal wind. And this actually creates um, favorable conditions for eddies. Uh, eddy, strong eddy mean flow interactions to occur. In particular, those um, northwest, I'm no, sorry, northeast, southwest tilted uh, disturbances can actually grow very effectively on this sheared basic state and grow through a process that we call um, uh, barotropic energy conversion. Um, and so you can get growth of eddies growing on this sheared basic state. And this is the eddy kinetic energy um, during the two, these two different times. So you can see an increase in eddy kinetic energy um, that um, occurs basically right at this region between easterlies and westerlies here, associated with stronger synoptic scale disturbances. Um, and then, you know, suppression of, of that particular thing here. There are actually issues about what comes first, the eddies or this mean flow. So um, I'm talking about a direction of causality that is sort of in one direction here, although that's a little bit muddy. Um, but regardless, you know, when you have a state like this, eddies um, tend to be stronger. Now, why is this important? Um, the importance of this is that these eddies, as I've shown in a previous paper and other people have shown, are extremely important for the moisture budget in this region. So this is a total precipitable water plot um, from um, this uh, MIMIC product at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, precipitable water goes up to 70 on this scale here. So this is very moist down here and then other colors are dry. And this is one example here where you, there's actually rotational disturbances associated with easterly waves that you can see bringing dry air from the subtropics into the tropics. And here's another indication of that here. And so um, plots like this hypothesized, uh, made us hypothesize in earlier papers that eddies are an important part of the moisture budget and they actually serve as a very strong drying mechanism um, for the tropical atmosphere. And we actually verified this, um, you know, in reanalysis data um, with the moisture budget. Here we go, they're rotating. Okay, so during piston, we actually saw very strong events that looked like that wave train that I showed you before. This is an example of Typhoon Kong Ray and uh, Super Typhoon Trammy. And you see um, cyclonic 
anticyclonic cyclonic. So it's referred to as a classic wave train pattern that existed in the Northwest Pacific associated with these synoptic disturbances, which eventually became tropical cyclones. Um, so this occurred September 28th, and you know before this, um, the occurrence of this particular event, the troposphere in most of the Western Pacific was very, very moist. Um, you know, precipitable water 70 um, and above in some regions. Um, but then, you know, after this very, very strong synoptic activity, you actually saw a pretty substantial drying across much of the Western Pacific. And one of the things that we're looking at from Piston is whether or not these synoptic disturbances in their existence can actually um, lead to um, drying of the um, you know, Pacific and Indian Ocean during BSISO events that could potentially um, contribute in some way to propagation of the BSISO. So that's something that um, is intriguing that I think we actually saw in action during Piston. All right. Um, so this does this mean 45 minutes, Karen? Two minutes, but that's like at the end of 45 minutes, right? Okay. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. Um, this is a modeling study showing that ocean coupling does have a very positive effect on the BSISO when you do coupled versus uncoupled models. Um, I think I might skip that. Um, let me talk about since I don't have too much more time here, let, take my time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I think that modeling evidence um, is pretty conclusive that coupling does have a positive impact of the B, on the BSISO. This is actually a plot from Fu and Wang, two thousand and four showing um, spectral power um, in northward um, frequencies here, southward frequencies here, and uh, this is spatial scale, like, you know, uh, meridional wave number on, on this axis. Um, and this is a coupled simulation for one particular model, and this is an uncoupled situation. So um, in an uncoupled model, you do get a BSISO in you know most most models. I mean, there are extreme examples where there's no BSISO with an uncoupled situation and a good BSISO with a coupled model. But generally, what you see is that there is something there in an uncoupled model, and when you couple, it strengthens and gets more realistic. Um, you know, not only in terms of strength but also um, spatial structure. So I, I think that there is evidence from ocean coupled experiments, a substantial amount of evidence that coupling does help um, both the strength and also propagation characteristics of the BSISO. And so it's not only this study, but there's been others like this. All right, um, I showed good and bad models yesterday. I won't show that again. Um, another thing that maybe isn't terribly surprising is that model skill at simulating the BSISO is related to model skill at simulating the MJO. So it's a correlation of 0.96 between um, MJO skill and BSISO skill um, defined using two different measures. How much more time do you want me to go, I guess? I, I could probably go for another two hours, but <laughs> when do you, you want to cut me off? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me just um, introduce this, um, and then and I'll talk, wrap up with a couple of other um, things. Um, so I said I would talk about real-time monitoring of the BSISO. So one method that people have been using is this EOF-based method of Lee et al. 2013. And so basically what they do is they take two fields, OLR and U850, and um, put them both into a covariance matrix, so unfiltered anomalies into a covariance matrix that they have designed for real-time use. And um, they find the leading EOFs, eigenvectors, um, empirical or orthogonal functions of that. And the leading two EOFs 
um, from this analysis during boreal summer are shown here. So this is EOF1 and this is EOF2. This explains 7.2% of the variance. This explains 4.9% of the variance. So that's not much of the total anomaly. Um, but you do see um, you know, some interesting things that you would expect from a propagating you know, quadrature structure type mode where you have these two EOFs out of phase with one another where convection starts here and you know, plausibly ends up here at a later time in this sort of tilted rain band structure. You could verify that these two EOFs are related by looking at the principal components or the amplitudes of these EOFs at any one time. And those are actually shown down here. Purple is EOF1, um, red is EOF2. And you could see that EOF2 always follows EOF1, well, not always, but generally follows EOF1. You could verify this to, by doing a lag correlation analysis to show that um, EOF2 lags by two, uh, um, 10 days you know, from, from EOF1. So this does generally represent a propagating feature where this comes first, then this follows then the negative of this comes and then the negative of this follows and it kind of goes around in a cycle. So people like to um, plot these principal components down here in a phase space that looks like this. So you can plot the amplitude of the first mode on one axis and then the amplitude of the other mode on another axis and trace out um, as a function of time how um, the atmosphere evolves in this phase space. So, um, for example, generally things go counterclockwise around um, this phase space where, whoops, um, whoa, where EOF1 comes first, and then that's followed by um, EOF2, and then it leads to EOF3 and, 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 and so on. Um, as in the EOF3, <laughs> negative of EOF2 and so on. Um, so, so you could trace um, this around um, in phase space like this. And so if you had a really, really nice event, what you would see is a nice circular pattern going around this diagram with a very, very nice high amplitude. You know, one EOF following the other very nicely. But generally, you don't see that. Um, generally, it, and this is an example of a good event. Generally, things look really, really noisy. And so the BSI, it's in particular, is not um, periodic. It's, it's more episodic in terms of its you know, comings and goings and even the ability to stay within um, you know, consecutive phases within the same event. So it's a very, very noisy um, type phenomenon, but you could diagnose what's going on, you know, in, in a phase plot like this. And um, basically you, you could break up, uh, you could, um, you know, calculate uh, the inverse tangent of the ratio of these two PCs to come up with a phase angle. And you could break up um, phase space into 45 degree chunks like you do here. And you, know, you call this phase one, uh, phase two, phase three, phase four, and so on. And each of these phases also corresponds to roughly where convection is in the, in the BSI its whole life cycle. So, um, you know, this plot labels Eastern Indian Ocean, for example, in this quadrant telling you where, where convection is. Um, so you could use this index um, to monitor the BSI, BSI so in real time, but you could use forecast model output to actually forecast where this index is going to be in phase space as well. And an example of where um, forecast information like that is actually uh, found is at the APEC uh, Climate Center in Korea. And they actually have a database of many dynamical models and uh, project those EOFs onto future states from dynamical models to um, provide a forecast of the future state of BSISO. And I don't think at this time of year they're actually doing anything because it's boreal winter, but during boreal summer, this site is active and shows a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of dynamical models, including ECM, WF, NSEP, and others um, for you know, BSISO forecasts. All right, um, probably should wrap up, right? 
So the other things I was going to talk about here were um, some recent results on surface fluxes in the ISO. And I think what I'll do here is just give these to Emily and she can post these <laughs> online and uh, you can look at that, those results um, online. But one thing that I wanted to talk about, I guess I don't have to show that plot, is um, just to be a little bit provocative here, is um, how might the BSISO change in future climate? So I've been actually doing a lot of work with my postdoc, Hian, to look at how CMIP-5 models predict changes in future MJO activity. We haven't looked at the BSISO yet. But um, these two axes on here essentially show the change in MJO precipitation variance in the Indo-Pacific warm pool on this axis. And this is a, a fractional change, so you can interpret this as 10%, 20%, 30% you know, changes. And this uh, axis here shows changes in MJO circulation. This is you, um, I'm sorry, this is omega or upward motion at 500 millibars, and this is uh, U850, so the strength of U850 anomalies associated with the MJO. And one really interesting thing that we're seeing is in general, models show MJO precipitation variations increasing in activity in future climate. That's consistent with um, previous results from Held and Soden and others showing general increases in precipitation in the tropics. But what's really interesting to us is that even though precipitation variations might increase, MJO precipitation, MJO uh, wind amplitude tends to decrease in models, even though precipitation is going up. So wind variability with the MJO is actually going in a different direction than precipitation variability in um, pretty much all the models that, that we're looking at. So, so that's really, really interesting. And that actually also has implications for the BSISO as well. Um, this is some kind of some low hanging fruit to, for people to look at to see whether or not um, BSISO changes are um, commensurate with MGO changes in these CMIP5 uh, simulations. And what's also intriguing to me is, are plots like this, um, where um, this, this study looked at um, changes in Indian precipitation variance explained by different time scales. And the 20 to 60 day time scale is actually decreasing in um, variance explained for Indian precipitation in this particular analysis relative to synoptic time scales. And so I'm really interested in trying to understand this trend and how it relates to the CMIP-5 model projections that I saw for changes in MJO activity and see if there's any link there. Um, but if this is true, uh, that you know, this, this trend continues, um, then you know, the BSISO might become a less important um, factor for Indian precipitation once we get into a future warmer climate, which would be really interesting. Um, okay, I'll, I'm done, sorry. <laughs>